Hello, this is Christine Deal, and this is Chapter 20, Genetic and Genomic Variation. Humans are highly homogenous. We are 99.5% alike, and so that 0.5% difference is important. It has health-related and social cultural consequences. So people vary in their individual DNA sequences by their copy numbers, polymorphisms, and the presence or absence of chemical additions that result in differing levels of gene expression or epigenetics is what it's referred to as. Human variation exists in more than 80 million places on the genome. These include insertions and deletions as well as structural variation and that's still a lot of variation for only a 0.5 percent difference. So as far as genetic diversity, the larger genes are more likely to display diversity than the smaller genes, which makes sense um, when you consider everything that you know, we've learned up to this point in the previous um, two units. Okay. And then to the genetic information that tends to be passed down from generation to generation with the least variation is mitochondrial DNA. So factors that decrease, excuse me, that increase diversity um, again, independent assortment of alleles and crossing over of segments of homologous chromosomes. Um, those larger chromosomes um, having um, more likely to display that diversity. Genetic anthropology is a field of study that uses a combination of genetic information and physical evidence to learn more about our history as a species. In 2006, the National Geographic Society began the Genographic Project with the goal of assembling DNA from more than 100,000 people and creating the largest database in the world. They wanted samples um, from all major populations and cataloged genetic similarities and differences. The human genetic variation is a term that is used to describe the genetic differences that can be found within and between groups of people. But another way that scientists are working to document human genetic variation is by assembling a map of human haplotypes. A haplotype is a group of genes that tend to be inherited together. Okay, a gene doesn't exist in isolation, it is always on a chromosome near other genes in intergenic regions. Okay, the International HapMap Project um, was completed in 2005 and provides a catalog of common patterns of human genetic variation. This makes it easier for the scientists to study the differences in the risk of disease and the response to drugs found in different human populations. So the HapMap project is an international collaboration of scientists from the US, Japan, the UK, Canada, China, and Nigeria. Population genetics examines the ways in which allele frequencies change in human populations over time. So what events keep those frequencies the same? What events change those frequencies over time? Uh, a species with lots of different alleles will have more genetic diversity. Okay, so the main purpose of population genetics is determining the factors that allow allelic frequencies to change over time. And population gen um, genetics is important to consider because disease risk can vary as a result of the geographic origin of one's ancestors. Okay, because rates of disease risk um, vary um, by that. Um, for example, sickle cell disease, which we studied in Unit 2, um, is common in individuals from African uh, descent. So, um, and hemophilia A is rare in people of African descent. The sickle cell disease, remember, it confers a protection against malaria. Um, if you're homozygous for the sickle cell, you will have uh, sickle cell disease. If you are heterozygous, you will have sickle cell trait and will confer um, a protection against malaria. So on a population level, it's very helpful. But when you look at an individual who's suffering from sickle cell disease, it doesn't, doesn't appear to be as helpful. Um, but we have to look at natural selection, um, which is the notion that organisms that are best suited to the environment will survive to reproduce and pass on their genetic characteristics. So that sickle cell trait um, had a um, evolutionary purpose there. Okay, you also have to look at migration patterns. Allele frequencies, um, there's one sequence variation for every 
200 to 500 nucleotides. Okay, um, so this is essential. Uh, allele frequencies, understanding this is essential for our evolution as a species. Um, genetic variation um, as a result of this is a good thing, and it is, as I mentioned, relevant to planning um, health care. Uh, the notion of heterozygosity, that's where the proportion of a population who are heterozygous at a particular locus. So how many people are heterozygous dominant compared to um, hetero, uh, homozygous dominant? Uh, compared to homozygous recessive. So if 95% of alloys in a population are dominant, then most people will be heterozygous dominant. Okay, and um, excuse me, homozygous dominant. And heterozygosity will be low. And then um, even fewer will be homozygous recessive. So then you've got that dominant trait that perpetuates in a population. Okay, so the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So if allele frequencies were to remain sta the same um, or to remain stable, um, the population would be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And these are five criteria that are needed to meet that. So everyone's got to stay in the same place. People have to mate randomly. They can't pick a partner, okay? Um, the population is large. Everyone has children. Okay, and then there are no mutations, which is really probably the hardest to um, maintain is preventing mutations because we know that those can occur spontaneously. But um, those are all the criteria of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Okay, so staying in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is not much fun, not really possible. Um, again, everyone must stay in the same geographic location with no migration. Okay. Um, an example would be that, um, let's see, like for example, uh, well, we'll talk about um, assimilation and migration coming up um, in a bit here. Let's talk about the founder effect first. So um, the founder effect is if a small group of people leave a large population. Okay, well, okay, we are getting into migration, okay, because this, this has to do with the founder effect. So if you've got a small group of people that leave a population and settle someplace else, they take their alleles with them. So, for example, the Dutch settlers to South Africa back in 1652, there was a small group of Dutch that immigrated to South Africa. One of them carried the gene mutation that caused Huntington disease, which is an autosomal dominant trait with age-related penetrance. Remember, the symptoms occur between age 35 and 50. Um, and so over time, then there became a higher rate of hunting disease in these Dutch settlers in, in South Africa than there were from their original, their place of origin. Okay, so once the Huntington allele was in the population, it continued to be transmitted. And so, again, the incidence is higher in the African near people than in the original Dutch population that they left behind. So the assimilation of immigrants into the population is a practice that is most likely to result in a change in the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So random mating um, has to occur for there to be that Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Um, no selection can be based on traits or anything else. Um, because if we picked our partner based on particular attributes, that would increase the likelihood that those traits will increase in frequency in the population. So mating has to be assortive um, and purposeful and um, mix similar and dissimilar traits. And no mutations. Um, mutation increases genetic diversity. Um, changes in genotype over time allow adaptation to environmental changes also changes the frequency of alleles in a population, and this ruins the heidi Warnberg equilibrium. This is probably the most difficult criterion to meet um, hardy Weinberg. Um, again, genetic diversity depends on changes in genotypes occurring periodically, and that is what helps us to adapt to environmental changes. The hardy Weinberg equation helps scientists keep track of how populations change and also helps clinicians appreciate why people with ancestors from the same geographic region share traits.
So here is just um, some, a few slides on the development of the Hardy-Weinberg equation. Okay, so you've got the frequency of the dominant allele, how many dominant are in the population, all the alleles in people who are homozygous dominant, and half of the alleles in people who are heterozygous dominant. Okay, and so then you take that equation, and then it continues on here. You can review um, these slides. There's also some examples, um, picture examples in, in your book in the chapter to review. And again. Okay, so the concept of genetic drift. That is the process by which allele frequencies decline because of sampling error. error. So populations become less diverse from genetic drift, and that occurs when not everyone has children, while others have many children. So future generations are more likely to pass the traits of people who have more children. So that occurs regardless of survival advantage. That occurs regardless of natural selection. So this is an example of random change in an allele frequency not based on natural selection. Okay, and so here is a depiction, um, it's from your book. Um, they have the, the marble um, illustration on page 392. Okay, so if the genetic trait drifted out, then there would be less diversity. So if um, the dominant, if the A trait um, was, if A was a trait that protected us from a disease, then we'd be less vulnerable to that disease. So again, these changes are not, um, this drift is not influenced by natural selection. They're just the result of random changes in the frequency of a trait in a population based on how many people have kids and, and what traits get to be mostly passed on um, over others. Okay, population bottleneck. This is a more dramatic population change here, there's some event that happens that severely reduces the number in a population. So only those who survive will reproduce. So only their traits will be passed on. This, of course, greatly limits um, genetic diversity. So on page 393, the book gives an example of the northern elephant seal. Um, in the 1890s, the seals were hunted to near extinction. About 20 remained and then reproduced to now to be over more than 30,000. Um, so there's less diversity in the northern elephant seal um, than the south, southern elephant seal who did not bottleneck, okay? So here's an example of the bottleneck, okay? Race and ethnicity, um, racial categories over, overlap. Um, populations do share common traits, but there are no sharp boundaries, so they make it they make these kind of kind of uh, somewhat vague terms. Um, we cannot use genetics to separate people into unique groups because there are no sharp boundaries. But people whose ancestors came from the same region do share some of the same alleles, and that can help us decide who. Um, who to screen or what um, risk they have. So uh, race uh, is a term that categorizes people into groups that share a common geographical background, ancestry, and physical features. Um, racial categories, again, over, overlap, do not reflect the continuous distribution of um, genetic variation into a population. Ethnicity Okay. Well, and well, and groups um, share some traits in common that sharp boundaries don't exist. Um, Self-identified race. I'm just going back a little bit to race here again. Self-identified race is often associated with the geographic origin of one's ancestors. So people who identify themselves as belonging to a particular race are likely to share the traits in common. Okay. So um, remember, many non-genetic factors contribute to our ideas of what race is, and many people can trace their ancestors to several different geographic regions. So um, it just gives us some idea of where to look when we think of what their, um, when we start to investigate what their um, genetic risk may be. So ethnicity, um, there are variations in ethnicities that have resulted from human migration patterns. 
uh, the impact of mutations, and small subgroups settling in isolated areas. So some of the factors um, in population genet genetics um, are part of this, including the, the founder effect and genetic drift. Okay. Um, results from the Human Genome Project have made it uh, clear that our old conceptions of race and ethnicity are not biologically based, but represent uh, more geographical and sociocultural uh, divisions at best. But again, um, like we said, um, knowing someone's race or ethnicity can be useful in identifying which genetic disorders an individual is more likely to have. For example, people of Celtic background, Irish or Scottish, um, which are, this is the Celtic background, are more likely to carry the mutations leading to the autosomal recessive uh, disease hemochromatosis, okay, which we know is um, a very common inherited disorder. Okay. Alrighty, so um, I believe I've already discussed this. So, um, again, Good to identify who has um, high-risk disorders, the health disparities based on um, their geographic origin, and um, and then um, and again that there's no real sharp boundary. Okay, so genetics contributes um, to the risk of disease and response to treatment, and sometimes these categories are helpful because we do not have more accurate ways to describe groups of people whose ancestors came from the same geographic region, and research studies often compare the effect of a particular drug in one race to the effects of that drug in another race. So it is useful to be able to identify people who are more likely to experience health disparities, um, and genetics um, contributes to the risk of disease as well as to um, how they will respond to treatment. So if we continue to use terms race and ethnicity, we need to remember that these have significant limitations when we try to apply them strictly to what we know about human genetic variation. But it gives us a great place um, to start in our investigation. Okay, so that concludes Chapter 20. Um, it's an interesting chapter. If you have any questions, um, uh, again, this was just an overview. So um, please um, also read the chapter and look at those pictures because those visuals are really um, are, are really good. And so if you have any questions, um, please contact me. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you.